Welcome to Us Crazy Christians, where we deal in common sense Christianity. I'm your host, William E. Smith, and today we're going to take you on a humorous journey on how this crazy channel came to be. Stick around. The seeds of us crazy Christians were planted back when I was about seven years old. I was sitting in church and I heard the preacher say that if I came to Christ, that no weapon formed against me would prosper and that nothing shall by any means hurt. And because I was being bullied and picked on a lot in school and in my neighborhood, that really resonated with me. So in that moment, I stood up, said the sinner's prayer and gave my life to Christ. Now, a lot of us crazy Christians were born in church, but not a lot of us were sold out to God. I was a true crazy Christian. At the age of seven, I learned all the books of the Bible. And not because anybody taught me. I was just upset at how long it took me to find. The pastor would say, turn your Bibles to such and such. And I'm still looking while he's reading the scripture. And so I decided I'm going to learn all the books of the Bible so I can get there faster than everybody. And I did. As a matter of fact, the pastor would use me to embarrass the adults in church. He would say, does anybody in here know the New Testament? Does anybody in here know the Old Testament? And nobody would stand up or nobody would raise their hand. And he said, Bill, give us the books of the Bible. And I jumped to my feet and started yelling them out as fast as I could. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalms of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Rebecca, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke. I tried to find some old pictures so I could show you guys. Uh, pictures of me uh, in, in church when I was young. So I, I had, um, they would have a ceremony where everybody would get their trophies from the different verses and stuff they learned. And it'd be a crowd of kids and you'd see me right up in front, the smallest one and the only one. Everybody got one trophy and I got two right up front. Now again, I don't want this to seem like I'm bragging. I'm actually, I just want you to understand when I say that I was sold out and I was dedicated to God that that's what I mean. I just want you to understand where I'm coming from because there might be some things we want to say on this channel that's going to make you think that I don't love God or that I don't, I never was a Christian. I am a Christian and I always have been. So, but um, I just want you to understand where my heart is and where I came from and why this channel was important. So I remember doing vacation Bible school, they would give out gifts for who could bring the most people to church. I always won. There was never anybody ever close to me. As a matter of fact, the van would have to come back to my neighborhood two times just to pick up all the kids that I invited. Even though I had come to Christ, I was still getting beat up, but I just figured maybe my faith was weak or I didn't serve God good enough, so I just decided I'd try harder. I started ministering to my bullies and inviting them to church. I would go take my little bit of money and buy candy bars and chips from the store and bribe my teenage neighbors to sit down and listen to me tell them about Jesus. And while they're eating their chips, I'm telling them about Jesus because I didn't want their blood to be required at my hand like the Bible threat. During summer vacation from school, I'd get up at the crack of dawn to study my Bible with radio preachers like R.W. Shambach, Kenneth Hagin, and Joyce Myers. I had been known to do this from sunup to sundown all day during the summertime. While my brother would be in our backyard playing hoops on our basketball rim with the other teenagers from the neighborhood, I'd be in the house studying my Bible and praying. Uh, matter of fact, to this day, I still can't hoop. But if the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons came to my neighborhood, my neighbors would run in to send their kids to run down and grab me because they love to see me argue with the Jehovah's Witnesses for some reason. And I would always stump them biblically and they would have to go back and get an elder and come back. Go back and get another elder and come back and I was always ready. Eventually they just stopped coming down my street. Fast forward to high school, some people call me the Rev because I carried a huge Bible to school with me every day. I had a big Jesus sticker on my locker. I used to take my Taco Bell check and go buy clothes and put scriptures down a leg or on the back or the name of Jesus across the leg, anything like that. And as a matter of fact, as I walked across the stage to get my diploma, you could hear chants in the auditorium, Rev, 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 Rev. I used to walk up to drunks on the corner and take their beer or their liquor out of their hand and smash it on the ground and commit to preaching to them. Now I know this was stupid and I know I could have got my head cracked. I was probably like 15, 14, 15, and, but I promise that I never got a bad response. I was just young and lucky. But I think the main thing, they were just so shocked that I had the gall to do this to them. 
and I promise you, they either came to church with me or I led them in a sinner's prayer right there on that corner. One time, I even interrupted a drug transaction. I was so pissed because it was happening like right, up, right down the street from our church. I immediately started walking towards them preaching. The guy who was buying the drugs took off and left. But the drug dealer sat there and listened to me. So I preached to him for a while. He eventually even apologized to me. So I go back right up the street to the church and there was a crowd of teenagers and young adults right there who saw me. So I had a little bit of a celebrity in church because of that. They was like, I don't believe he did that. I became the youngest deacon in that church's history um, and eventually went on to be a youth pastor. Um, I'm tempted to say the name of the church because they're still thriving in Detroit right now and they're a lot bigger now than when I was there. Um, I still love the pastor. We are, have a great relationship. I love a lot of people that go there. We're friends. They always talk to me on Facebook. They follow me. A lot of them subscribe to this channel already. I just, uh, I pray that after they see some of the stuff I talk about in the video that they still love me. So I don't know, they might not even want to be affiliated with me. So I'm not going to say the name of the church, but I'm tempted. All right, so again, I'm giving you all this background for a reason. So please hold on. Context is key. Um, in my personal life, just when I'm talking to people at work or in my neighborhood, in my building, I realize if we're getting into God or religion, um, and, and no matter how much fact I give, no matter how much scripture I give, because I show the Bible, and anybody who know me personally know, I'll give you the Bible. So I mean, it's not going to be Second William chapter 2, it's going to be the Bible. And, um, but one response that I seem to get a lot, and which has caused me to make this video, is because people tend to look at me like, they, they hit me with the, well, I've been saved all my life. I grew up in church and it's like, I, they talk to me like I don't understand. And, uh, and they ignore the facts or the scripture that I give and the proof and evidence that I give in scripture. And they just they eventually get to where they lean to faith or uh, like you don't know like I know and stuff like that. And it's like, so that's why this video is here. I want you to know a lot of y'all think you was in church. You think you was sold out. Yeah, I hear you. You went to church because your mama made you go. My parents didn't go to church with me. I walked by myself to church. They, they still alive, you ask them right now. They wouldn't go with me, I went by myself. I walked as a kid, I would carry my Bible and, and I was doing gospel rap back then and stuff like that too. I was walking by myself, so I'm rapping, saying my gospel rap as I'm walking with my big old Bible to church in the cold, in the summer, until the church got a van, I tried to find a church closer to me, I went to different churches, whatever. But I went, I prayed by myself, I read by myself, I studied by myself, I didn't have no help. My parents wasn't reading their Bible, they wouldn't teach me, I, would, I, didn't, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. So it was something I was doing by myself. My brother wasn't going to church, my sister wasn't going to church, it was just me. And, and I did this faithfully, dedicated, and I lived it. And everybody who knew me knew it. I was the same wherever I was at. If I was at work, I was a Christian. If I was at school, I was a Christian. If I was in the neighborhood, I was a Christian. And so a lot of, I have people now, even people I went to high school with, say, hit me up and they'll be like, oh, I was saved too. And I was like, man, well, I didn't know. I couldn't tell. But everybody knew I was saved. So again, I'm not saying it in a bragging way. It's not to be that way. I want you to understand because I don't want you, when you watch some of the stuff that I show, or some of the proof of the evidence that I show on this channel, to look at me like I'm an outsider or like I haven't been saved all my life. Christianity has been my life all my life. Our goal on us crazy Christians is not to be controversial, it's to set you free. I've been bound by religious bondage and I've been freed from its shackles and I promise you that freedom is 1,000 times better. The Bible says, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I just wanna share some things and, and let God lead you at, on this channel, we're not trying to convince you of anything or trying to make you believe anything. We're just gonna give information, we're gonna give facts, we're gonna give scripture and let you decide. We think God loves you, loves us, way better than we've imagined. And we just wanna show you that. I was preparing to go to Bible college. So now while preparing myself to get ready for Bible college, I had made a declaration that I would never get married. Jesus wasn't married, Paul wasn't married, and they did way more for the kingdom than anybody else in the Bible. So they wasn't married, I ain't married. Um, and I had two fellow deacons that I really respected cornered and they were ministering to me and we argued back and forth. They tried to convince me that uh, marriage was good. They both married and that I should get married too. And uh, they hit me with this scripture. One can chase a thousand, but two can put 10,000. In my young mind, I don't know, 18, 19, I think I was, that made so much sense to me. And all of a sudden I visualized that I could see me and my wife conquering the world and beating up devils all over the kingdom. and. Uh, 
and that really resonated with me. And so that kind of put a halt to my uh, Bible college plans, and I end up getting engaged. Brothers, man, I appreciate everything y'all trying to do, man, but I ain't getting married, man. Jesus never got married. Paul never got married. They reached the world for the, for the, for the gospel. I'm going to do the same thing. Man, you ain't Jesus or Paul. Well, I'm going to try to be like them, though. Man, you got to get married. Why well, I got to get married? Man, you so, like Jesus and Paul. Man, because I'm going to pray and fast all day, man. Just focus on God. Man, I'm going to reach the world, man. Preach everywhere. That's what I'm going to do, man. man. <laughs> What are you talking about? You gotta get married. Why gotta get married? Man, marriage is overrated, man. You ain't happy being married. Why you want me to get married? Serious? You got to get married, man. man. I don't want to get married. That's... Listen to what we saying to you. The Bible say one will chase a thousand away and two will send ten thousand to flight. Ten thousand. Read that. Dude, imagine what you and your wife can do to the kingdom as a team. Two. Oh man. Yeah. See that? I'm trying to tell you, man. Clearly. Man, thanks, brother. I never thought about that, man. Thanks, man. So at the age of 19, while still working in a drive through of Taco Bell, I wisely got engaged and eventually married a lovely young lady from my church. And she had a wonderful three-year-old son that I absolutely loved. And the funny thing about him was he looked like me. And so rumors spread through my old churches, people I had grown up with in my teens, and they were like, he's a fraud, he's a hypocrite, I knew it. They just swearing I had a child out of wedlock. I never corrected them. Two reasons. One, I figured they were looking for some kind of reason to accuse me. And secondly, and most importantly, I never wanted my son to hear me deny him. So I just ignored him. But the truth is, I still have girlfriends who are friends of mine now from my teenage years who make fun of me. They crack jokes about how whenever things got hot and heavy, I would actually flee fornication. I would run out of their houses and run down the street and they'd just be laughing at me. Woo! No! The Bible says flee fornication. I rebuke you, devil. He gonna go shun that I'm not gonna do it. One night, I was at my fiance's house and we were, we were reading the Bible and we ended up having sex. After the act, I threw on my clothes, left the house, and got in the middle of the street on Mendota in Detroit. And I lay there prostrate, flat on my face, hoping and praying that a car would come and run me. Just screaming and crying, forgive me, Lord, I'm sorry, thinking I'm going to hell. I wanna say this, th this may be irrelevant to this video, but I think it's important. I was laying there in the street, feeling like the biggest hypocrite in the world. Uh, like I betrayed God. I mean, I, I, all this stuff, I had preached holiness and abstinence till marriage, and I had preached all this stuff to these people and got in their faces, and, and now I do the thing that I got on their cases about doing. And so I could swear, as I lay in the street, I heard in this ear, William, I love you. It was so loud and clear that I jumped up out the street because I swore somebody was standing right there next to me, kneeling in my ear. Although that voice saved my life, talked it up to just my imagination. Because I was taught that when we sin, separates himself from us, or, or sin, or we separate ourselves from God by our sin, either way. And so God was nowhere near me. He was pissed at me. God was mad and angry. I had betrayed him. I had betrayed his saints. I had betrayed all the stuff I said and taught for years. And so um, I looked at it like that could have been God talking to me. I was taught that the tithe was 10%, that I could never beat God's gift. If I gave to God, he would give it back to me, good measure, pressed down, shaking together what he calls men to give into my bosom. That if I sold sparingly, I would reap sparingly. But if I sold bountifully, I would reap bountifully. So from about the age of 16 to about the age of 27 or older, I routinely gave a 25% tithe. Off my income tax, off my checks every week, and a minimum 10% offering. I had been known to give my entire check to the church, just sign it over to them, even after being married with children. The hell with the bills. God got me. Yeah, baby, I'm home. Okay. So how are you feeling about us giving my whole check to church on Sunday? I know, right? I felt it in my spirit, too. Yeah, that was kind of risky. I know. I, yeah, the light bill is passed, dude. That's right, baby. We touching the green. 
God's aid them. Hey, 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 we can't all give God. You know how I go. That's right. Oh, that's right. Press down, shaking together. That's right. That's right. Uh, honey, man, about the lights. As a matter of fact, one day, my pastor, who at the time was known to out people for not paying their tithes, uh, to out them publicly, uh, made a declaration to the congregation. He said, the top two tithe payers in the church are Dr. Miles and William. Now, Dr. Miles was a physician. I made minimum wage. Now, there's a lot of different things I'm leaving out of my, uh, my story, my religious life growing up. I just want you to get the idea. So after many years in an unhappy marriage, I felt like I needed to escape. My then wife came to me and she said, you know God hates divorce, right? You know that God will be pissed. You know that he won't answer your prayers. You know that you'll be cursed, that all kind of bad things will happen. And I said, I know. And because I felt like God had turned his back on me, I turned my back on God. I stopped going to church. I stopped paying tithes. I stopped reading my Bible. I stopped praying, but I did have sex. A lot of sex. As a matter of fact, during this period of my life, for several years, I kept getting promotions. I made more money than I ever made in my life. I was able to spoil my kids. I had a nice car, a nice apartment. Girls thought I was gorgeous and charming. Whatever I put my hands to prosper, good things kept happening to me. But I kept feeling like any moment, all hell was gonna break loose. Any moment, my world would come crashing down. All the curses that I brought upon myself were coming. And on top of that, I was going to hell. Felt like the devil in any moment would jump out the closet and say, I got you, sucker. <laughs> I've been blessing you all these years so you can forget about God. But now, you so far into sin <laughs> that you can never get back. I got you, sucker. <laughs> I got you, nigga. <laughs> Now, during this period of debauchery or uh, backslidden, whatever you want to call it, there were several other times when I felt like God spoke to me. I would hear stuff like, I love you, I adore you, you're, I'm proud of you, you're smart, you're talented. It was confusing to me. And one time, now look, you may not believe this, and you know, I, I can't help you. <laughs> I'm just telling you my truth. But I could have swore I heard God talk to me while I was in mid Baby, why you sad? Did, did you just tell me you love and adore me? Hell no. Nah. I got a man. I told you. There was an issue that arose with a couple of my kids that really concerned me. And I felt helpless to do anything about it. I, it was out of my control. And so I felt like I had to go talk to God and asked for some help, or some wisdom. I, I didn't know what else to do. And as I did this, I felt like God held me tight, like he squoze me. I, I felt like he, he went to the edge of his seat and he was like waiting for me, like, is my boy coming, is my boy coming? It, it was weird. It was comforting and confusing at the same time. But honestly, this confusion was one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life because it caused me to question everything I had been taught about God up until this point everything I believed, I began to realize that I feared God more than I loved him. That our relationship wasn't a father and son relationship, it was a master and servant relationship. And how can a servant really love his master? Now maybe because after I did my part, I felt like God would do his part, maybe that would cause me to feel some love for him. But I don't know if that's really genuine love. Nonetheless, I think that a lot of us in the body of Christ, a lot of us crazy, crazy Christians, do the same thing. We fear God and we mistake it for love and we think we love him. We're gonna get a lot more into that later. So a couple years later, ironically, after I started going back to church, I lost that good job. I had to get a job out in the suburbs of Detroit. Then my car broke down, so I had to catch the bus. Uh, and the bus ride was about two hours long, so I was bored. So I decided, you know what? It's been years since I started, since I picked up a Bible. Let me go start reading my Bible again. And I'm like, I got these long two hour trips, why not? Picked up the Bible, 
started reading it, and I went to Romans, because Romans got some of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. And I felt like I heard God say, start at chapter 1, verse 1. And I was like, okay. So I started reading Romans chapter 1, verse 1. And as I started going through that book, and would come to different scriptures that I could quote verbatim and loved and preached about, embarrassment, overtook, embarrassed laughter would overtake me because I saw that so many scriptures that we believe, that I taught, that I believe were wrong. In context, they were talking about something else. It was so embarrassing. I would be on a bus, a crowded bus, and break out just laughing real loud. I was like, whoa! And people would look at me, I'm like, oh, yeah. I forgot where I was at. I was caught up in this Bible, and it was just so much embarrassment. It was never happy laughter. It was embarrassed laughter, like, oh my God, I feel like an idiot. I taught this to people on the street, people in church, in Bible studies, to my kids. That is not what it means. Now, it's not as though I've never read the Bible or a book of the Bible from the first chapter and the first verse. As a matter of fact, from a child, there were several books of the Bible I could quote verbatim from the first verse to the end. I had a veil over me, filter. There were certain beliefs I had, certain things I was taught, so that no matter whenever I read the Bible, the Bible had to conform to my beliefs. Instead of me reading the Bible and taking it in context to what they meant, or what the writer meant, I went off of what I believed, and it filtered what I read. And I realized that a lot of us crazy Christians do the same thing. We have beliefs that we're taught, that our grandma said to us, our praying grandma, or our pastor said, or some bishop that we uh, adore or worship who knew the Bible way better than us said, and we believed it and we ran with it. And it has filtered, colored, how we see things, how we view God, how God views us, etc. A lot of those blinders have been removed from my eyes. A lot of those blinders are still being removed. There are things I'm learning every day. All we want to do here at Us Crazy Christians is help, hopefully, hopefully, move some blinders for you. Truth will set you free. So be warned, we're going to get into some controversial things. Uh, the rapture, separation from God, hell homosexuality, um, the Bible being written by God, uh, how to read the Bible. So again, our, our goal isn't to be controversial. It's just to give you the truth and hoping and believing and praying that the truth will set you free. Free from fear, free from religious bondage, free from unforgiveness and pain and hurt, free to love, free to have peace and joy and a greater relationship with God. I have two questions for you. Is it possible that God is more loving and kind than we previously believed? And could it be possible that God loves and adores us much more than we've ever imagined? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to listen to me. I, I really appreciate that. We, set, we put out a new video every Sunday. If you want to see more from us crazy Christians, please like this video, share it, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notifications bell so you can be notified every time we put out a new video. Oh, and if you have questions or comments, please leave them under the video. I'll read them all. Be blessed.